So January 26, 2016 is when the tribunal ruled. There have been two non-compliance orders issued by the tribunal since then for the government not comply, complying to the tribunal's order. There's also been uh, an NDP motion passed in the House of Commons unanimously um, urging the government to immediately um, provide relief for First Nations children. And currently, there's, uh, there are other things going on. Um, the tribunal's called back some sessions. Uh, so I'd like to know, Cindy, if you could uh, give us an update on the government's response or lack of response to the CHRT ruling. Um, and then I wanted also a sort of double barrel question. How do you respond to their claims that they are complying um, with the order or that they want to comply but as uh, senior bureaucrats l said last week from INAC, um, they're having trouble finding enough First Nations children to supply health care services to. Well, the government of Canada welcomed the decision and ignored it, is basically what happened. And um, they uh, did nothing for the children until budget 2016 was released. Our calculations were that the shortfall just on the immediate relief measures, just to take the sting off the discrimination, not at all to deal with the depth of it, uh, was well over $200 million. In this budget, they announced 71 million, of which 10 million the department allocated for itself. So it gave it six, uh, $61 million went out the door for kids, which was less than a third of what was required. Now they doubled down when they were critiqued about that being so inadequate. They doubled down and defended it, and actually kind of suggested that we weren't being thankful for all the money they were giving us. And um, then finally, it came out that they admitted that they actually had not prepared budget 2016 in response to the tribunal's order at all. It couldn't have possibly been prepared as a response because they developed it in the fall of 2015. And they did not adjust it at all when the tribunal ruled. So uh, that explains the two non-compliance orders. On Jordan's principle, they were ordered to immediately implement it. And uh, we were so grateful. And I hope I don't embarrass her, but there's someone here that I, I want to acknowledge because th these are the people that are really out there every day. And her name is Carolyn Buffalo and her son Noah. And they have been fighting this um, since the very beginning. And there's Noah. Hello, Noah. <laughs> and Carolyn and Noah were both with us uh, when Jordan's principal passed in the House of Commons. And we all hoped that day, didn't we, Carolyn, that uh, kids like Noah wouldn't have to wait anymore. And the government didn't do anything on Jordan's principal until July of 2017 or 16 when they announced up to now ladies we all know those sale racks right up to 70 percent off or whatever it's up to 382 million for Jordan's principal but then they said not all First Nations children and this is important to know about Jordan's principal doesn't just apply to health it applies to all public services so it's to ensure that First Nations children can access public services on the same terms as other kids. The Fed said no. It only applies to children with short-term critical illnesses and disabilities. And then uh, it created a process we didn't understand about how to implement it. No one knew how to implement it. Well, it turned out in government documents that they've only spent $5 million of that $382 million to help kids. And uh, they are saying that any unspent money will be clawed back into the treasury, just like that, 13, that 11 million you saw there. And uh, let me just ask the group here, because the feds say they have a hard time finding families. Here, does anyone in this audience know of a First Nations child who's been denied access or been denied a service outright because they're First Nations would be available to any other kid? So I'd say to the Minister of Indigenous Affairs, you need only come to see people like you. And we are taking the federal government back to, to the tribunal on non-compliance orders. It'll be heard on March 22nd to the 24th, 2017 in Ottawa. And uh, I just want to give a big shout out to our legal team who have worked for nothing more than brownies and cookies. And uh, you know.
And the parents of one of those great lawyers is here with us today. Uh, his name is David Taylor and his mom and dad are here. So I hope they'll wave and we can all give their family a big thank you uh, for all the great work that David and the rest of their team has done. Uh, Spirit Bear, the teddy bear that you saw there, well, he's not here today because he was watching the cross-examinations of the federal witnesses on Jordan's principle, and he's been now made, being made a barrister, B-E-A-R-ister. <laughs> so uh, get those Valentines writing because we really need to keep the, the pressure up on the federal government to do the right thing. Great, thank you. Um, I have two, I have a question for both. Alanis and Cindy. So um, the film was released in 2016, but it will be um, getting most of its broad circulation this year in 2017. And so I'm wondering about um, the way that this film is going to resonate um, with Canada 150. I, I looked this morning and it, uh, it appears that the latest numbers for the federal federal budget or fed federal spending for the celebrations of Canada 150 will be half a billion dollars and I think that will be about 250 million in Ottawa itself though of course that's just a projection it will most likely be much more as any budget has functioned um, and so I'm wondering how do you think this film will resonate with audiences um, this year in particular Uh, well, I'm talking with both of you. Um, just being here this evening and seeing your response, I tell you, it's so, it's so strong and it's so encouraging and it's those kinds of things, it's your voice that's gonna make a big difference. Because at the end of it, it's a public that decides. Remember that, you have a lot of power. And I'm very happy with the film. Uh, you know, people saying, even at the film, but you're crazy making a long film like this. But you know, I think of all the years that it took to the kind of things that our people went through. I think the audience is happy to sit here for two hours and 42 minutes, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> and I must say, Two things that I often repeat myself, but I want to make sure that you people know. Um, first of all, I have to say a big thank you to the film board to have supported me to do this, because it was a very long process, and of course it's expensive, but it's the history of this country. This is part of the history. Just the fact that we were allowed to film it, it's historical. And for me, the greatest thing was, you know, I sat there and I watched the whole, I heard every word uh, more than once because as we were making the film, I had to listen to everything again. And for me, and I said this and I will repeat it, repeat it again. In 1960, we became Canadian citizens for the first time. For the first time, uh, well, 1951, when the, in 48, 49, when the United Nations was created and then a branch out of a uh, human rights um, movement, then Canada was forced to look at the way they were treating their indigenous people. And from that, it was the first time that one paragraph in the Indian Act was changed in 1951. In 1951 was the first time that an Indian who lived on the reserve, for instance, and perhaps was uh, brilliant and want to study and was never allowed to be uh, go to going to university previously to 51 because we were not Canadian citizen and the only way to get into university was to deny who you were. You were no longer an indigenous person, you were a Canadian citizen, then you could enter the university but you were no more welcome to where you came from. And 51 was the first time. And then by 1960, now another other paragraphs were changed and that's when we began to organize. It was the first time that the government said to our people, you can now write to the government and identify your territory. That was big news, I can tell you that. It's never happened before. And this is when we started to 
travel, meet each other. I'd never been anywhere except in Quebec, and I didn't certainly know all those different nations. So, and we felt so rich and so happy to meet each other and to realize all the different languages that were still living, and we were comparing languages, and many, many things happened at the time. We could have powwow ceremonies, and you didn't go to jail because of it. So all this new way of, of uh, being allowed to do things was incredible. But at the same time, uh, I was told that uh, in the jails in Canada, 68% of the people were indigenous. And at the time, I, I was fighting in a different way. I was not making films yet, but I was singing and talking about history. I was very much trying to influence change in the educational system that had really done us very badly, writing books about the history, creating, to create hate towards our people, and they succeeded well for many, many years. And now, something different was happening. So I went to, to the courtroom many times, here, in Regina, out west, in Winnipeg, in Ontario, in Quebec, to just sit there, and there was always a person from the Human Rights uh, Commission that was sitting there watching. And I'd always sit next to, to the person from Human Rights we were watching. They'd be lined up, mostly men, but some women too. And someone would read, you are accused, blah, blah, blah. A lot of things were about drinking and I don't know. And so it was guilty. A fine, you go to jail. There was no respect towards our people in the courtroom. They were just like, the feeling was, we know all about you, you're guilty. Shut up and uh, go to jail or pay the fine. And I am now 84 years old. And when we made this film, <laughs> I was in the courtroom this time, seeing our people as witnesses, being heard, being respected, it was such a different thing. I never thought I'd live to see this. And just that alone, we have gone a long way. And look who we have. Yeah. And look at what we've done. I just uh, would say that I don't buy that we're so broke as a nation that the only way that we can fund the Treasury is by racial discrimination against children. I just, that to me is so wrong. And a Prime Minister who doesn't understand and doesn't undertake to take action, in fact, all members of Parliament, regardless of party, do not stand up and make sure that this stops, that is a signal of their lack of leadership. And they fail to understand the compassion of Canadians. Because when I go out there and I talk to Canadians on the left or right, none of them are comfortable with seeing a half a billion dollar birthday party subsidized on the backs of racial discrimination against children. Um, so we need to stand up and just make sure this stops. I just want to uh, take this moment just to make a personal thing. I, I you normally don't talk about my personal life, but uh, my family sacrificed a lot during this 10 years. It'll be 10 years this trial is filed on February 23rd, and it is such an honor for me to have my sister here um, who uh, has been part of that journey. So thank you, Sheila, for being here, and thank you to my family. Alanise, I have a question for you. Uh, I heard you ended up with over 300 hours of film and edited it down to under three hours, which I think is short. Um, can you talk about some of the choices you made and how they related to this particular, how you wanted to tell this particular story? First of all, you know, if you're trying to cover what goes on in court, it can be extremely boring. <laughs> and very long. So, as a filmmaker, I think the first uh, um, rule is to be able to be a storyteller. So that an audience can sit there and find it interesting and it's a story and it, you, you're using many different people to make to make the circle of this story. This is how I work. 
but it is a lot of work and uh, it's not the end of it. I'll probably make another film. Uh, I'm extremely, uh, I, I'm just so happy that I was able to do it and that uh, the <coughs> dignity that I saw in the courtroom, I will never forget it. And for me, from what I have seen in the past, it was so different that uh, I think it comes from all the people. It's the local, the res reservation, there's small fights in there. People try to, they fight against all kinds of little things that happens and ruins their life and fight for taking care of their children, fight to keep the children, fight to, for the old people. Everything is a fight. But we must never give up. And we've made a lot of progress and we're going forward. I, uh, I know that. And maybe one day we'll get that canoe shed we've all been waiting for. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, well, kind of building off of your choice of editing, um, one, um, one testimony that I'm really glad that you had kept in the film was um, near the end, um, and I'm blanking on his name, but he testified, he stated that reconciliation isn't a choice. Yes. And, um, and I'm, I'm really grateful that you, Chief Joseph. Chief Joseph, I'm really grateful that you kept that particular poignant part of his testimony as a kind of a, a focal point near the end because that resonates a lot with me um, in English and film studies and as a, a settler grad student in the University of Alberta uh, that um, Universities now are really trying to grapple with what to do about reconciliation. You, you see these conversations across the news, um, across, across Canada, and I just think that um, for a university as, as inheritors of um, the really damaging policies of the residential school systems, we don't have choices to engage. Um, there, there is no opting out, and so it, it deals with it means choosing to hire indigenous tenure track faculty. It means hiring indigenous administrators, having more indigenous students. So reconciliation takes on a really particular form for universities. But I'm wondering what is reconciliation to you as an advocate and as uh, an artist? So what shape does reconciliation take for you? It's a big question, I'm so sorry. The fact that we that we are here, what do you call that? Yeah. <laughs> Reconciliation. What the, the movement has done is extraordinary. I just think that it there's got to be a continuity. Because I'll tell you, when somebody has gone through life in secrets having been abused, and sometimes repeating it, abusing, uh, all the, the uh, shameful things that you go through in, in life and that uh, you don't want anybody to know. And all of a sudden, all these people have been called in to tell their whole life story, which is very painful and very difficult. What I worry about is when, when the person goes home alone, and you say, oh my God, now I, all those people know about me, about my life, and you need to hold their hand longer. Some people, <laughs> some people don't want to have their story being known by everyone. They don't want a film to be made on it or a book. They feel, uh, okay, I've, I've gone through this now. I want it to, even some say I want it to be erased or Others, they want it to be known. They, they, they feel well, it's gonna help other people that have gone through the same thing. There's all different feelings. But I don't think we can just say goodbye, uh, hope you're well. I think they need more and more after this exercise to, um, to feel compassion, to, to, to have someone hold their hand and it's okay, you know, to, to give them the time, I think. I think it's, 
it's a long process. It's not just, oh, we did this, it's great, and now we've got all this collection, and I think we have to think of the people that have gone through, it's like a confession to uh, how do you live with that? How do you um, feel when you know that people are talking about your story? It's a very sensitive uh, thing, and I think all of us, we have to, to do what we can for these people, to continue loving them and telling them it's gonna be okay, you know, that smiling, holding hands, I think it's very important. I think there are very few people on the planet who has done more for reconciliation than Ellen Niso Bomsa one. That's what I think. Um, to me, reconciliation were those children in the courtroom. You know, children understand this. When they, uh, a non-Aboriginal girl told me that the definition of discrimination is when the government doesn't think you're worth the money. And that child has uh, come to every single Have a Heart Day um, since we started and is determined not to give up. You know, children, on, on Tuesday, Valentine's Day, um, I'm going to be at Parliament Hill with over 700 children from all different diversities. And they aren't there wringing their hands wondering what they can do. They are going to be there to read their letters to the elected officials inside of there because they understand that those are the people that really report to this generation of children. And they expect much better than what they're getting right now. There was a non-Aboriginal girl, I remember walking with her, um, and along with Charlene Bearhead, who some of you know. And we're walking along on, well, for Have a Heart Day, and um, she sees uh, some workers there putting down sod, and, and uh, this big house. And uh, she says, well, you know what they're doing there? And uh, Charlene and I say, well, they're putting down sod. She said, no, that's not what they're doing. They're trying to make that place look beautiful. And what happens in that house is not beautiful for children. She was talking about the House of Commons. I have a good follow-up question. Uh, I think the film does an amazing job of uh, representing how the government bureaucracy works and hearing the people who worked for INAC and particularly describing like supplying their own evidence that they discrim racially discriminate against First Nations kids um, I, it was just the most stunning thing I think about that film you really captured it really well so I wonder what you both think this film reveals about the strategies the government uses to continue to racially discriminate against First Nations children. Um, like about the mindset of INAC and insights into then how to proceed, to, you know, how to mobilize around that. It ties into another question about, you know, what can people in general do, but also what do you see as a very focused way to mobilize against that unbelievable bureaucratic stasis so it seems like well they can't deny it because you know there's a few example in the film that you see the actual child that is uh, persecuted in a way and uh, so it's there and I think what the film does it educates including the government itself everybody to see what it is like what the real story is what do people go through, the parents, the children. It's very plain and you can see it very well. So whoever thinks that uh, there's no proof, uh, I don't know where they were. But, uh, so that's what a film does. It's very powerful and it influences changes and it exposes the situation and we can go forward. That's what it does and I'm a documentarian person I love my work, I love all the people that are in these films, and I will continue as long as I have my health. <laughs> yeah. 
what just strikes me is um, I don't believe these are evil people at all. Um, what, uh, you saw the story of Dr. Bryce. He's one of my personal heroes. You know that uh, the shot that Eleni shows you at the wintertime and his, his gravestone and those frozen flowers? Well, I had placed those flowers on his grave a couple days before when I read him the decision in Beechwood Cemetery. I wanted to go there to thank him and tell him that justice finally came and that his work planted the seeds for me and many others to carry on. I think what he taught me is the power of courage and how little of it we really have. Um, you know, we all have our values. And when we look at the government kind of going astray of them, and when I think about these government bureaucrats, um, it brought to mind Dr. Bryce and this whole teaching around moral courage, where uh, people like Rushford Kidder have said that in Western society, we reward physical courage, right? Uh, if I found somebody slipping on the sidewalk and I helped them, uh, I would be rewarded and I get a, the mayor would have their picture with me and all kinds of stuff. But we punish moral courage. We punish the people who stand up and say the right thing. And uh, that's the whistleblowers. And what we need to do is we need to honor those people. And when someone speaks up and says something, we need to be the second in line to say, yes, he or she is right. And we cannot allow, we cannot allow our politicians to do what they did in this decision. And that was they welcomed the decision. And then uh, it was covered very well in the media for a couple of days. And then it was replaced by a story that parliamentarians thought was more important. And that was the discussion of heckling in parliament. We, the people of the period, are the ones that have to speak up. We can't just wait for the government to do it. You must sign one of those Valentines, and you gotta send one tomorrow, and the day after, and the day after that, until we finally get to a point in this country where no First Nations, Métis, or Inuit child ever has to recover from their childhoods again. It's all in your hands, it really is. Okay, so this is our final question of the panel before turning over to you, and this is a, a combined question from Melissa and I. So um, it's about the, the importance of children that you were speaking about, the importance of children actually depicting them in the film. And so uh, the question is, what did you learn from the children involved in the tribunal and the campaigns, um, not only involved in the courtroom from your side, but also in a, in a filming aspect? And then to follow up on that, what would you say that to um, critics that children are, are too young or, or immature to, to understand um, this film if they were to be an audience member or the larger topic? I don't agree. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> children are so incredible. Children are very responsible. You know, instead of saying to a child, don't go there, don't do this, don't go up there, you're gonna fall down. If you just listen to a child, you'd be very surprised what's on his mind. Freedom of speech for a child is very important. And I have been so amazed with the responsibility of all children from many different nations that took on marching for, for Shannon's, uh, for her school, for the rights for children. It, they're unbelievable. See that little boy, I don't know how old he was when he says, there's something wrong in this world and I want to fix it. You know, how old was he? Seven, eight? Seven. Uh, his dad uh, came to the v showing of it and he started to cry because now that kid is taller than I am. Well, yeah, <laughs> yes. You know, I just, I just, I think children are so extraordinary. <laughs> I love to hear them speak. I love to see their decision or what do they think of a certain, and they were coming to the courtroom and the exercise, and I also I, we have to also thank the teachers, especially in Ottawa, obviously who were doing a, a workshop with the children and explaining what this case is, and it, they were so involved. I'm telling you, it was like an army of kids really uh, knowing where they're going, what they were marching for, and the love of indigenous children was so big that it's unbelievable. Children are the main thing in my heart, in everything I do. 
And Eleanor, you know uh, Danielle Fontaine. You've met her a few times, right? Uh, one of the great teachers who brings her classes. Well, her sister is here actually today. So thank you. Um, I think the kids totally get it. It's the adults that don't get it. You know, people say, um, you know, even a kid could understand. Well, they do understand. The adults just don't get it. They're, we've normalized the racial discrimination in this country so much that we no longer see it for the urgency it is. If I was on CNN tonight and I announced that that nutcase uh, south of the border uh, was going to <laughs> Uh, save money by racially discriminating against 165,000 children, you'd all be outraged and you'd be out there in the Women's March. Well, it's happened, the government of Canada does it every single day. Um, so don't let it become normal. Kids don't see it as being normal. In fact, one non-Aboriginal girl said to me, she said, you know, I don't understand that. They teach us all about bullying in school. So where are all the adults? Like they tell us that we're not supposed to be quiet when someone's being bullied, but the government is bullying these kids. And we're the only ones out here really saying anything. Where is everybody? Right? The other thing the kids have taught me is that you defeat the darkness with love and light. When you come to have a heart day, the children all plan it. There's only one rule, no adults talk. I think they should bring that into parliament. I think <laughs> things would be a lot, you know, honestly, I swear to you. Um, and they, they have glitter, they have songs, and they're not there angry with a bullhorn. They are there um, so honored to be a part of changing the world with love so that every child matters. And that's what the kids have consistently reminded me of, is that you change the world, you get rid of discrimination with love and light. Thank you. Cindy and Alanis for coming. I'm so honored you were here.